Uh, we have to get started today, so let's uh, get ready for today's class. Uh, the first thing before we start is I was asked to pass on an announcement about an AMSA uh, general meeting. That's the American Medical Student Association next week, Tuesday, in Agnes Arnold. And then I do have one announcement of my own today, which is uh, this Friday, which would be March 1st. Um, we're not, I'm not going to have my normal office hours. So the normal office hours, which are 11 to 12 that day, are going to be canceled just for that Friday. Um, I do have some availability late in the afternoon if you need to come see me about something, but it's, uh, it's going to be pretty tight that day. So if you, if you need to see me, let me know. We'll try to work something out, but it's a pretty busy day for me. Also, if you, in case uh, you put my emails into your spam folder, um, I did send a message earlier in the week about uh, a change in the office hour schedule, which is now going to be 12 to 1 on Mondays, still 11 to noon the rest of the day. So a small change in that, in case you missed that. All right, so we're going to get into uh, a good part of Chapter 5 today. So remember that now we're talking about uh, determining amounts of substances, and we're going to get into talking about chemical reactions and how to calculate substances that participate in chemical reactions. Thank you. Um, so we are going to start, if, if you're having, um, if it's not clear from. Okay, so getting into what we're going to talk about today. So last time what we ended with was we introduced the concept of moles. Uh, we introduced how there's a relationship between moles and number of atoms and molecules or moles and grams of substances, which is even the more useful one. Um, and what we closed with last time was learning how if we know the chemical formula of a compound, we can use that chemical formula to calculate mass percentages of all the elements. So mass percent was one of the topics, the very first topics we covered in this course. And now we know how to take a chemical formula and determine mass percent. In reality, the way we use this in experimental chemistry more often is to go the other way. So we're going to take mass percents and convert them into chemical formulas. So we're going to learn how to do that today. Before we get into that, no, we need to introduce a concept called empirical formula um, because it turns out that if you're given the mass percent of a compound, you can't actually determine its actual molecular formula. Uh, you can determine what's called the empirical formula. So what exactly is that? So the molecular formula, as we know by now, is the total number of each atom in a molecule of a compound. Um, so it gives you exactly how many of each element is in there. And again, those amounts can be sort of interpreted as the ratio of the number of atoms of that type that are in the, in the molecule or the number of moles of that element that are in a mole of compounds. So there's a couple of different ways to think about that, but it's the total number, and it's not necessarily the smallest whole number ratio. Remember, when we talk about covalent compounds in particular, we often have molecular formulas that don't represent the smallest whole number ratio because they actually tell us how many of each atom is in that molecule, not necessarily the smallest ratio. The empirical formula, however, is that smallest whole number ratio. So the empirical formula of any compound is the lowest whole number ratio. So it's still a whole number um, situation here. Okay. So it's not necessarily the same as the chemical formula or the molecular formula. We should be familiar with the idea already that if we have an ionic compound, as we learned, the chemical formulas for ionic compounds are already given as smallest whole number ratios. So in any ionic compound, the empirical formula is exactly equal to the what we call ionic or uh, chemical formula. So there's really no difference for that for ionic compounds where you're already finding the smallest whole number ratio of the elements. But for many covalent compounds, the empirical formula is not the same as the molecular formula. Or in other words, the molecular formula is not the smallest whole number ratio. So a few examples here are if we have N2H4, what we have to do is find the greatest common factor to be able to reduce this down to an empirical formula. Now again, this is not something that's usually that useful to do. There's never always a good, not, there's often not a good reason for wanting to know what the empirical formula is. But as I said, as I alluded to earlier, um, if we're using mass percentages to find formulas, it's really the empirical formula that we get. So the molecular formula, if we have N2H4, which is called hydrazine, 
Um, we can find the empirical formula by taking the greatest common factor and reducing to the lowest whole number ratio, which we sometimes had to do when finding formulas of anic compounds. So if we divide both of those coefficients by 2, you would get NH2. Remember, whenever we're doing any sort of manipulation on a chemical formula, whether it be going this way where we're reducing it to the empirical formula, or later on we'll learn how sometimes we take the empirical formula and convert it into the molecular formula using some of the information that we have, if we do something to one coefficient, we have to do the exact same thing to the other. So if we double one coefficient, we double the other. If we divide one by two, we divide the other by two. We always want to keep that ratio the same, otherwise we'll, we'll change the total identity of the compound. If we have water, H2O, is there any way to reduce this one? No, because we have just one oxygen, so you can't reduce that to a smaller whole number. So the empirical formula of water is also its molecular formula. That can happen sometimes. Um, C6H6, that, that fancy cyclic uh, hexagon-shaped molecule that we talked about at the end of Chapter 4, what would the empirical formula of this be? CH, we just divide by 6. So it seems like we're getting this pretty good. Um, and then a more complicated one that has three elements. Again, we find the greatest common factor, B3N3H6. Greatest common factor is 3. I hope I'm using the right math terminology because I always am paranoid about messing that up. I think greatest common factor is what we're looking for. And anyway, it reduces down to BNH2. All right, so that would be the empirical formula of that compound, the smallest whole number ratio of boron, nitrogen, hydrogen. Um, so again, just to reiterate what we're doing here is if we want to convert molecular formula to empirical formula, we divide by the greatest common factor. This is only something that we would typically do for covalent compounds because ionic compounds, if written correctly, would already be written as empirical formulas. So we don't need to do anything to those. So that's how we convert molecular formula to empirical formula. This is not something we will typically do, as I said, but it's, this does illustrate the relationship between the two. So then what we have is an, uh, an approach now that allows us to determine the empirical formula of a compound if we know the masses of the elements or the mass percentages, as, as we'll see in a slight variation. All right, so this is kind of working backwards from what we did last time. So last time we took a chemical formula, which is a, you know, tells us the number of moles of each element. We converted that into masses and then found mass percentages. Here we're gonna go, we're gonna go backwards in some sense. So we're gonna take the mass of each element that we have, either absolute mass or expressed as a percentage. It works both ways. We're gonna convert the mass of each element to moles. Remember, the empirical formula is the smallest mole ratio of the elements in that compound. So if we can find the mass of each, the moles of each element, we're on our way. And remember the way that we do that is we use the atomic mass of the elements. The atomic mass is the key uh, conversion factor that links mass to moles. So just like we did last time. So what we're going to see a lot today is that we're going to basically be repeating all of the things we learned last time, but just in different contexts and different combinations. So the individual steps that we're going to use in problems like this, or even in the more advanced ones we do later on, should not be difficult. The difficult part is sort of stitching them all together and remembering all the steps and not making any mistakes along the way. So the individual steps are pretty simple. We convert mass to moles, which we've done a million times last time. The second step then is we get the number of moles of each, and we're going to convert to the lowest ratio, to the smallest ratio, because remember, typically speaking, as you'll, as you'll see in this, we end up with molar amounts that are you know, random decimal numbers, don't have any whole number relationship, obviously. So if we want to convert that to a smallest ratio, we have to divide by the smaller, smallest amount. So we're going to normalize to whichever number of moles is the smallest, make that 1, and we're going to divide all the rest by that same factor. So we're going to dividing each molar quantity By whichever of the molar quantities is the smallest, that normalizes that one to one, and the rest will be all relative to that. Okay. So that's going to be step two, is dividing all those molar amounts to get them down to a, a simpler ratio. At this stage, there's a third step that is sometimes necessary. I don't think it shows up in any of the examples I'll do today. I should probably fix that and put that in at some point. Um, but anyway, if necessary, there's a third step, which is sometimes when you do step two, you don't get all whole numbers. You still end up with some simple decimals um, you know, that you have to deal with. And so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply then the result by a small whole number to make everything, to, to remove the fractions and decimals and make everything into whole numbers.
So if we have fractions or decimals in your answers, we need to get rid of those because the empirical formula will always have only whole numbers in it. So if you're not there, you need to do one last step. So as an example, if we, if, let's say we did the first two steps and we ended up with an empirical formula that was C H 1.5. All right, so we had one, the ratio was one carbon to 1.5 hydrogen. This would not be our final outcome because it's not whole number. So if we have a 0.5 in there, we have to double everything. So remember, we have to multiply the whole thing by 2. So we're going to multiply the coefficient on carbon by 2, which makes it C2. Multiply 1.5 by 2 makes it H3. So still the same ratio, but now actually whole numbers. So this step is one that often people forget. They try to just go crazy with rounding, and they're like, oh, CH1.5, let's round that to CH2 and, and you know, call it a day. That's not something you want to do in these types of problems. So if you're really close to a whole number, if you're like 1.98 or 1.97 or something like that, sure, go ahead and round it to 2. But if you're sort of in between, you want to make sure that you apply this last step here. So as another one, let's say we got, um, you know, N 1.333, and then we got H or something like that. Okay, let's say we got this empirical formula. Um, and if you see a 0.3333 or a 0.66666, you should automatically think of multiplying it by 3 instead of by 2, and that'll get rid of that decimal. So this would give us N4H3. I don't think that's a real compound, but imagine it was. You'd get N4H3 by applying that last step. Okay, so don't forget that. Don't try to do too much rounding in these. Make sure that you apply that if necessary to get to whole numbers, all right? I don't think this last step is going to come up in any of the ones we do today, but make sure you don't forget about it if you're doing homework problems. All right, so let's see how this works then. So one variation on this type of problem would be we give you the actual masses of elements. So we say that we have a compound called vanadyl chloride. Uh, it's a rare example of a metal compound that's a liquid at room temperature, so it is kind of unique. And if we take this orange liquid that I'm showing here, we can determine that if we have, it would have 1.47 grams of vanadium, 0 0.462 grams of oxygen, and 3.07 grams of chlorine. So adding all three of this together would give us the mass of the compound we have, which is not what we need here. But we need, we need the masses of the individual elements, which in this case are directly given to us. So if we have masses of the elements, the first thing we do is convert them into moles. So we have three elements, and we convert to moles. And these are the exact same types of conversions we did last time. So we start with the mass of each one. For vanadium, it's 1.47 grams. And then we convert to moles. Put moles in the numerator. We put grams in the denominator. So we're going to divide by the atomic mass, which is grams per mole. And if we go to the periodic table, we can find the atomic mass of vanadium, which is atomic number 23 and the atomic mass is 50.94. So that's the number we're going to divide by to convert mass into moles for vanadium. All right, so 1.47, one mole is 50.94 grams. So that multiplication gives us that we have 0 0.0288 moles of vanadium. So that's the moles of our first element. And then we do the same thing for the other two, which would be oxygen and chlorine. So for oxygen, we have 0 0.462 grams. These are now, in this case, given to us directly in the problem. So one mole of oxygen. We will again go to the periodic table to find its atomic mass. This is one that you'll use a lot, so it's 16. So you will eventually learn that whether you want to or not. So 16 grams of oxygen per mole. So that cancels out grams and gets us moles of oxygen, which is basically the same number, 0 0.0289. All right, and then the last one is chlorine. So we have the mass of chlorine was 3.07 grams. Label that more clearly, sorry. 3.07 grams of chlorine. One mole of chlorine has a mass of how many grams? Again, that's straight from the periodic table. Chlorine is over here, 35.45. So that's the atomic mass that we would use for that element, 35.45. Goes in the denominator. All right, so same step three times just for the three different elements, and we get 0 0.0866 moles of chlorine. And then, as I said, the next step is 
we want to convert these into small ratios by dividing them by the smallest one. All right, so our chemical, our empirical formula in non-standard form could be written as V0.0288. Because remember, the subscripts in a chemical formula just tell you the relative numbers of moles of each atom. So we could write it as this, but this is a non-standard way of doing it because they're not whole numbers, anything close to it, really. And then CL, we have 0 0.0866. So then to convert these into potentially whole numbers, or at least into more reasonable numbers, we divide by the smallest. So the smallest of these three numbers is 0 0.0288. So we divide all of them by that. And when we do that, these might not work out exactly right. For example, 0 0.0289 divided by 0 0.0288 is not exactly 1, but it's 1.01 or 001 or something like that. So anyway, what we end up getting is VOCL3. Those are already whole numbers, already smallest whole ratio, so we don't have to do anything else to that formula. So we again take the number of moles of each element and figure out what they are as a ratio by just dividing by the smallest in that case. All right, any questions on that one? All right, so then we're going to now go on to a slight variation of this, which is using mass percent to find the empirical formula. All right, so in this case, we have a binary compound consisting of boron and fluorine, and we know that it's 15.94% boron by mass. We want to know what's the empirical formula. Um, so there's a couple key words in this problem we want to be familiar with. The first is that, remember that binary means that it has only two elements in it. So boron and fluorine are the only two elements in this compound. And furthermore, we're given the mass percent of boron. We don't know the mass percent of fluorine, but we have to remember because of conservation of mass that if you have 15.94% boron, the rest must be fluorine if there's only two elements in it. So the mass percent of fluorine, which is not given directly, is going to be 100% minus the mass percent of boron. All right, so let's not be tripped up by that. If we just give you one mass percent, if it's a binary compound, the other mass percent is just 100 minus that. Okay, so we end up with 84.06%. All right, so we now have two mass percentages, um, and what we're going to do with this now is when you have percentages, remember that those percentages would apply whether you have however much of the compound you have, whether you have a tiny speck of it or a huge pile, you'd have the same percent by mass of those elements. So when we have a mass percent as our given information, we're going to assume a very convenient amount of compound, which is 100 grams. So if mass percent is how we're setting things up, let's assume that we have 100 grams of compound. And so if we assume 100 grams of compound, the mass of each element that we have is exactly equal to the mass percent. So 100 grams of compound would have 84.06 grams of fluorine and 15.94 grams of boron. So now we have masses of each element and we do the same process as last time. We convert to moles and we, re we reduce that to the lowest ratio to get empirical formula. Um, so it's kind of, there's kind of an analogy or a parallel to what we talked about last time. So when we're given a chemical formula and trying to find mass percent, we assume conveniently that we have one mole of that compound because in one mole of the compound we know exactly how many moles of each element we have from the formula. In this case, if we're given mass percent, the convenient amount is let's assume we have 100 grams of compound and then we can directly use those percentages as mass amounts. So we're going to do the exact same set of steps now. We're going to convert the mass of each element into moles. So for boron, if we assume 100 grams of compound, we have 15.94 grams of boron. And then we just use atomic masses to convert to moles. So from the periodic table, the atomic mass of boron is 10.81 grams per mole. So again, we're dividing by that so that the grams cancel out and we convert into moles. So this time we have 1.474 moles of boron in 100 grams of compound. And then we do the same thing for fluorine, which is our other element. We have 84.06 grams of fluorine in 100 grams of the compound, convert to moles by using the atomic mass in the denominator. So the, the atomic mass of fluorine, if you have your periodic table in front of you, is 19. I don't want to flip back and forth a million times, so I'll just write that in. So we have 19 grams of fluorine per mole. We divide by that to get 4.424 
moles of fluorine. All right, so now we have molar amounts of both elements, and then we just convert those into the smallest ratio. So we have B1.474 F4. Oh, come on. There, it took a break. All right, 4.424. So those are the mole amounts, not a standard way of writing a empirical or chemical formula. So we divide them both by the smaller of the two numbers, 1.474. And this comes out very close to BF3, which is the correct answer for this problem. All right, so if, if we're given a mass percent, it's the same series of steps. We just have to assume the percentages are gram amounts if, if we're presuming that we have 100 grams of compound, which, as I said, we can assume any amount of compound because the mass percents won't change. 100 grams is the most convenient to start with when you're given percentages. All right, questions on that variation? Yes? Well, the standard way to write it is with whole numbers. So the standard way, so this, if, if I, you could, you could write the formula as B1.47 F4.42, and that's technically not incorrect. It gives you the right ratio, but you know, people will look at you like you're crazy. You're like, well, that doesn't help me at all. So you, you always normalize to get it to the smallest ratio. So this is the standard way of writing it then, with whole numbers only. And we don't, as a, as a reminder, we don't include coefficients of one. We leave them out, so that's why that's not there. Um, and that's what we end up with. Anything else? All right, so then the next step is going to be one last thing to talk about. So this gives us the empirical formula, but not necessarily the molecular formula. And for covalent compounds, the empirical formula is not particularly useful because it doesn't tell us anything about the structure of that, of that compound. So, you know, we talked about C6A6 in Chapter 4 and a little bit today, which has that nice, you know, ring structure with six carbons in a ring. If we just found the empirical formula of that compound using mass percentages, we'd get the empirical formula is CH. And that doesn't tell us anything. It just tells us that we have a one-to-one -one ratio, but it doesn't tell us how many we have. We can't infer anything about the structure from that. So if you want to actually get the molecular formula from this, you need one additional piece of information. So we would need to give you the molecular mass. So once you know the empirical formula, you can calculate what's called an empirical mass, which would basically just be the molar mass of that empirical formula by adding up the atomic masses. And then it's going to be related by some small whole number to the molecular mass. All right, so the way this works is, here's an example. If we have... Let's say we do all the steps that we just did, you know, use mass percentages or masses and found mole ratios, and we got an empirical formula of CH2. We want to know what's the molecular formula, and we have to, in order to do that, we have to give you that the molecular mass is 70 or whatever AMU. Because if the empirical formula is CH2, the molecular formula could be CH2, it could be C2H4, it could be C3H6, C4H8. The molecular formula could, in principle, be any whole number multiple of CH2, so if we want to find out which one of those it is, we need what the precise molecular mass is, and then that molecular mass and the empirical mass will be related by some small whole number that we'll use. All right, so let's see how this works in practice then. If the empirical formula is CH2, we can calculate an empirical mass by using the atomic masses of the two elements. So we have one carbon in the formula, which has an atomic mass of 12.01. So that's the contribution from carbon. Our empirical formula has two hydrogens, which have masses of 1.008. I guess I'll do AMU because that's what we're given. But remember, grams per moles and AMU are basically interchangeable. Um, they mean separate things, but the numbers are the same. All right, so we have two hydrogens, 1.008. So that means our empirical mass, you don't even have to be that precise with these because they're all related by whole numbers anyway is 14 AMU. So our empirical mass, which would be one carbon, two hydrogens, is, is 14. And then what we do to figure out how does the empirical formula and the molecular formula relate to each other is we divide the two. So if we take the molecular mass, which would have to be given to us in this problem, there's no method that we have for finding that unless it's expressly provided in this type of problem anyway. We divide the empirical mass and the molecular mass, or the molecular mass by the empirical mass. So that's going to be 70 AMU for the molecular mass, as we're given in the problem. We just found that the empirical was 14, and so 70 divided by 14 is 5. And so then what that means is our molecular formula is 5 times the empirical formula. So if we want to find the molecular formula, we take our empirical formula, CH2. The molecular formula will be some small whole number multiple of that. In this case, it's 5, and we end up with 
C5, H10. All right. So without also being given the molecular mass of the compound, the molar mass of the compound, you're not able to find molecular formula from, from mass percentages or any other way that we we're, we're going to learn today. Okay? So that's the additional step you need if we ask you for the molecular formula is to consider the relationship between molecular mass, empirical mass, and then multiply by that, by that ratio. Right? So let's put it all together with one last example. So we have a compound that has... It's 28.18% by mass manganese, 30.8% carbon, and 41.03% oxygen. And we want to know, uh, and, we, and we have the molar mass, sorry, is 389.98, and we're going to determine this molecular formula. So the setup is almost the same as last time, but instead of just giving you mass percents, if we want to find the molecular formula, we also have to give you the, uh, the molar mass. Okay, so it's an additional step at the end, as we'll see. So we're going to still start by finding the empirical formula because that's the first thing we need to do for this. So we assume 100 grams of compound. And we take the mass percent of each element. And in 100 grams, we're going to have that many grams of those elements. And we're going to convert those into, into mole amounts. So same series of steps as before. For each element, we convert to moles. So we have 28.18 mass percent manganese, which means that in 100 grams we have 28.18 grams. And we use atomic masses to convert to moles. So this is hopefully starting to get a little bit repetitive because we just take the atomic mass and put that in the denominator. From the periodic table, the atomic mass of manganese is 54.94. I do encourage you, especially in this section of the course, to have a periodic table in front of you because I won't flip back and forth a million times to try to save time. Uh, but anyway, if, if you go to the periodic table, that's the number you get for manganese. And the moles then would be 0 0.5129, for, if we're being really exact with significant figures, I suppose. More than we need. 5129 moles of manganese. Same thing for the other two elements. We have mass percentages, and we're going to convert those into moles. So for carbon, it's 30.8. One mole of carbon has a mass of 12.01 grams. Again, we're straight off the periodic table for these atomic masses. And we get 2.564 moles of carbon. And then last one is oxygen. 41.03% by mass, so we have 41.03 grams of oxygen. And then the molar mass or atomic mass of oxygen is 16 grams per mole. So that divides out. And we get two moles of oxygen, which is 2.564. Okay? All right, so that's what we end up with. We have this many moles of each element. And then to get the empirical formula, once again, same series of steps. We're going to just divide by the smallest of those. So we can round things a little bit here because we have way more decimal places than we need. But we have manganese 0 0.513, carbon 2.56, oxygen 2.56. So we divide all of these by 0 0.513, which is the smallest of the three, normalized to that. And what we get up, what we end up with in this step is MnC5O5. So that is a valid empirical formula. Small, you know, all whole numbers. Um, obviously, the smallest ratio of those. But then, as we said in this problem, we want to determine the actual molecular formula. So we can't necessarily stop here. The last step then is to see. Now, it is possible, of course, that the molecular formula and the empirical formula are the same. That's not impossible. But to check if that's true, we have to calculate the empirical mass. So once we have the molecular, sorry, the empirical formula, we can calculate empirical mass. Molecular mass is given to us in the problem. And so what we end up with is we have one manganese in the formula, which is 54.94. I'm going to leave off units because I want to do this quickly. And then five carbons with the atomic mass of 12.01. Five oxygens with the atomic mass of 16. So our empirical mass is 195. grams per mole, or very 
get close to that. And then finally, the last step is to divide the molar mass by the empirical mass. All right, so again, a lot of steps in some of these problems. None of them on their own are particularly difficult, but we have to remember you know, why we do them and how to do them and all that stuff. So molar mass divided by empirical mass. In the problem, we're told that the molar mass is 389.98. So that number has to be given to us in these types of problems. The empirical mass that we just found is 195. And so those will be related by a factor of 2. And so what that means then is that our molecular formula is 2 times the empirical formula because the molecular mass is twice the empirical mass, which means the molecular formula is twice the empirical formula. So we take this whole thing and multiply it by 2. And we get manganese 2 C10O10. All right? No longer the smallest homer ratio, because molecular formulas often are not, but that's going to be the correct answer in this problem that would have the correct molar mass and the correct ratio of all the elements. All right, so we take all of these subscripts here, MNC505, we multiply all of them by 2. Remember, we can't just do it to one or two of them, we have to do it to all of them. So manganese goes from 1 to 2, carbon goes from 5 to 10, oxygen from 5 to 10, and that's our final answer. All right, any questions, anything unclear? All right, so that um, takes care of that. And then the last thing we're going to talk about that's still closely related is what's called combustion analysis. Um, and again, this is you know, going to ramp up the complexity just a little bit. It's still a series of steps that none of them are difficult individually. It's just a matter of, of executing all of them correctly and, and doing them all in the correct order. Um, so the reason we're going to talk about this is, in reality, if, we go, you know, if we're doing experimental chemistry and we have some unknown compound and we want to know what it is, there's not really a magic technique out there that says, oh, this compound has this mass percent of this element and that mass percent of that element. In most cases, you can't get that information very easily. And for certain types of compounds especially, that's very difficult to do. So we use what's called combustion analysis as sort of an indirect way of determining the mass percents of elements, or at least the, um, the masses of each element. And then from there, we can back out the empirical formula just like we've been doing. So it's just a, a more indirect way of getting there, but it's a way that works for many types of compounds especially organic compounds, things that have a lot of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, things obviously that have to burn well to do this. So what you do in combustion analysis is you take you know, some precious compound that you either extracted from a natural source or you know, made with your own two hands and you're really proud of all the effort you put into it, you take that precious compound and you set it on fire, um, which is sometimes dissatisfying to do, but it does give you some important information about the compound. In particular, it gives you the empirical formula, although as we'll see in a somewhat roundabout way, but it's, it's, again, none of the steps on their own are very difficult. So the way this works is we take our organic compound, which is mostly carbon and hydrogen, might have some other elements as well. We can't really do this analysis unless there, if there's more than three elements. If there's more than three, you have you know, two different elements or more than two elements that make up the other stuff, and it's not possible to back those out with just this analysis. But if you have a carbon, if you have a compound that's just carbon, hydrogen, and one other element, which is often true for a lot of organic molecules, oxygen being a common one, you've probably heard of carbohydrates. Those are all, you know, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is the three elements. So if you have three elements and carbon and hydrogen are two of them, you can use combustion to figure out what the empirical formula is. All right, so you, when you burn an organic compound, we're gonna talk more about combustion reactions later on in chapter six, I believe it is, the next chapter. But suffice it to say for now, when you burn an organic compound, all of the carbon in that compound gets converted to carbon dioxide. So as you likely already know, when you burn something, you release a bunch of carbon dioxide, and that comes from all the carbon that was originally in the compound. Any of the hydrogen that's in the compound gets burned off as water vapor, H2O. So all the carbon goes into CO2, all the hydrogen goes into H2O, and then all the rest of the stuff makes other types of gases that you can analyze, analyze or sometimes don't need to. You usually do those indirectly by, by difference. So the way this works then is once we know how much carbon dioxide is produced, so we burn our compound and we measure the amount of carbon dioxide that was produced when we burn that compound. From that, we can back out how much carbon was in the original compound because all of the carbon that's in our compound is going to go into the CO2. We can extract how much of that CO2 is made up of carbon, and we'll see how the steps work for that in a little bit. And then we do the same thing for water. All of the hydrogen from our compound goes into the water, so we're going to use the amount of water that we form to extract the mass of hydrogen. 
And then finally, for all the other stuff, we're going to typically do this by difference. So we know when we start burning the compound, we know the total mass of compound we started with. So we have to measure that at the beginning of the experiment. That's how much mass of compound we started with. We find the mass of carbon. We find the mass of hydrogen. And then, of course, the difference, whatever whatever's left, is going to be the mass of the other elements, whether it be oxygen or something else. So we subtract the mass of carbon. We subtract the mass of hydrogen. And then the leftover is going to be the mass of all of our other stuff, whatever it is. Okay, So it's basically it's, it's going to be three steps in most cases to get the masses of all the elements, or only two steps if carbon and hydrogen are the only two. But you're going to extract the masses of each element, and then we're going to go through the steps that we did already to convert those masses into an empirical formula. So as I said, a lot of individual steps involved in this. None of them particularly difficult, but it's just a matter of putting it all together. Um, and in, as you guys know, the blackboard questions are particularly unforgiving, so you have to make sure you get all the steps right to get the answer, obviously. All right, so what this allows us to do then is it allows us to determine the empirical formula of an unknown compound. All right, because as I said, there's not usually a simple analytical technique we can do that says that just spits out the empirical formula. So you guys, have, you know, you guys have probably watched like crime TV shows where they, you know, like CSI and stuff, where they, you know, they go in the lab and they, they put their goggles on and there's neon lights everywhere and then there's some, you know, dramatic music playing in the background. They put a chemical sample into a machine and it spits out exactly what it is. It doesn't usually work that way. So uh, you know, it's a little bit more involved than that in real life. And combustion analysis is one of the many techniques we use. Not the only one, but one of the many techniques we use to find formulas of unknown compounds. Okay. So that's how that works, uh, and let's see it now in practice to understand the steps that go into this. All right, so let's suppose that we have a compound that has carbon, hydrogen, and bromine. So again, these types of problems, no more than three elements are we going to be able to do in, in most cases, and it's analyzed by combustion. So we take five grams of the compound, and we burn it, and when we, when we analyze coming out the other end after we burn the compound is... 0.871 grams of CO2 and 0.179 grams of water, we want to know what is the empirical formula. All right, as I said, a lot of steps here. So the first place you want to start is you need to find the mass of carbon and the mass of hydrogen because the mass of everything else is going to be determined from that. Um, so we need those first. Uh, it, it turns out we're actually going to later on undo some of these steps, but it's, it's necessary. It's a necessary evil of these problems. All right, so if we start with the mass of carbon, it's going to be a long, you know, a series of conversions, about three steps, as I'll do it here. There are other ways to potentially approach this. So if you find a way of your own that's a little bit more, you know, friendly to you, go ahead and use that. This isn't this isn't the only way to do it. But the way I like to do this is again start with a given information. We have 0 0.871 grams of CO2, and our goal is to figure out how much of this 0 0.871 grams is carbon. So obviously that 0 0.871 grams is the carbon and the oxygen together that formed in when you made CO2. So what's the mass of carbon in this? The first thing that we can do is we can convert moles, sorry, grams of CO2 into moles. So we're going to use the molar mass of CO2. So we don't have that here. So the molecular weight or molar mass of CO2. Remember, for molecules, we just add up the atomic masses to get the molar mass. So it's the same concept as, as, as elements, but you need to add them together. So it's 12.01 for carbon, and then two oxygens, which are 16 each. So the molar mass of CO2 is 44.02, and then that's going to be grams per mole. So if we want to convert grams of CO2 into moles of CO2, we put 44.02 in the denominator. That's the molar mass. All right, now we have moles of CO2. How do we figure out how many moles of carbon are in one mole of CO2? All right, so now we want to figure out how much carbon is in there. And remember, the chemical formula tells us this directly. So if the chemical formula is CO2, how many moles of carbon do we have in one mole of CO2? It's just one because 
CO2, there's a coefficient or a subscript of one on carbon, so that means one mole of CO2 has one mole of carbon in it. So that gives us moles of carbon. We actually will use this number later on, but for now we need to convert it to a mass because that's the first step is to get the mass of each element. So we could save this number or we could just convert it to directly into mass. And for that, we now go backwards and use the atomic mass of carbon. So if we have moles of carbon to get to grams of carbon, it's still going to be grams per mole, which is atomic mass. But this time, we're going to multiply by that number instead of divide by it. Okay? Because it's 12.01 grams of carbon per mole. So moles cancel out, and that gives us grams. Okay? So 0 0.238 grams of carbon. The other way to approach this problem is sort of as almost like a mass ratio where you, you, know, you figure out, oh, what's the mass percent or mass ratio of carbon in CO2, and then how does that translate into the mass of carbon in 8.871 grams? That's fine if you want to try to work that out on your own. I'll, I encourage you to do that, but I think this way it still uses those same mole conversions that we've been working on so hard the last couple of days. So this is the, the approach that I'll use to do this, but like I said, there's other ways to go about this. So that's carbon. We do the same thing for hydrogen. But this time for hydrogen, we start with the amount of water that was formed when we burned the compound. So we got 0 0.179 grams of water. And same step as before, we're going to convert that into moles of water. All right, so the, moles, the molar mass of water is just the sum of the masses of hydrogen and oxygen, or two hydrogens and one oxygen, more precisely. So that's 18.02. So the molar mass of water is 18.02, so we divide by that to get moles. Here's the step that's a little bit different for hydrogen. So if we look at the formula H2O, how many moles of hydrogen are in one mole of water? It's two because we have a subscript or coefficient of two on the, on the, on the H. So it's, this step here is a little bit different. It's not one to one anymore, it's two to one. So for every mole of water that we form, we're actually having two moles of hydrogen in there because of the chemical formula being H2O. And now we can use the atomic mass of hydrogen to convert into grams. The atomic mass of hydrogen is basically one, so that number is not going to change much. If we're really sticklers about precision, it's 1.008 grams of hydrogen in one mole. Again, the last step being just multiplying by the atomic mass from the periodic table to convert moles back into grams. So we get 0 0.0200 grams of hydrogen. So now we have mass of carbon, mass of hydrogen. If we're going to find the empirical formula that also includes bromine, remember there's a third element in there, bromine, so we need to find mass of bromine. We don't have any direct information about this because we don't know where the bromine went, so we don't know what it converted to when we burned it, probably in reality a mixture of things. But we have the masses of each element, so we can do it by difference now. So the mass of bromine is going to be the difference between how much compound we started with and how much carbon and hydrogen are already in there. So the mass of compound we started with is 5 grams. We need to have that information given to us to be able to do this. So we had 5 grams of compound. So that's the mass of the compound. We subtract the mass of carbon, which is 0 0.238 grams. We subtract the mass of hydrogen, 0 0.0200. And of course, whatever's left is going to be the bromine. So we get 4.74 grams of bromine. So what we now have, which are underlined here, are three masses of elements. 0.238 grams of carbon, 0.02 grams of hydrogen, 4.74 grams of bromine. We have three masses. Now we just have to convert into moles to get empirical formula. So converting to moles is now the same that we've been doing all along. So as you can see, these, these problems take a while. Um, so get you know, as as I always encourage, practice these over and over again because the series of steps will become internalized, and you can you can you know beast through these in, in just a minute or two. Um, so we're going to do moles of carbon now. So we have 0 0.238 grams. That's the mass that we found from the combustion data. And then we're going to basically we're going to undo the last step. We saw that the last step here was to convert moles into grams. Now we're going to undo that to convert the grams back into moles. So if you prefer, you could do this as two steps. You could calculate the moles first and then calculate the grams. It, it really doesn't matter what order you do it in. 
So one mole of carbon has a mass of 12.01 grams. So we divide by that to figure out how many moles of carbon we have. So we get 0 0.0198 moles of carbon. If we do moles of hydrogen, this again not going to change much because the molar mass of hydrogen is 1. We add 0 0.0200 grams of hydrogen. That's what we found from how much water we formed. And then we convert that back into moles by dividing by the atomic mass. It doesn't change the number very much at all. So we divide by atomic mass. Grams cancel out. That gives us moles of hydrogen. Same number. And then for moles of bromine, we found by difference that there was 4.74 grams of bromine. So one mole of bromine from the periodic table, we find that the atomic mass is 79.9. And that gives us 0 0.0593 moles of bromine. All right, with mole amounts of each compound, of each element, we can figure out the empirical formula of the compound by division. So C, we have 0 0.0198. Hydrogen, we have 0 0.0198 moles. Bromine, we have 0. 0 0.0593. We're going to divide all of those by the smallest, which is 0 0.0198. So we get CHBr3, and that's going to be our empirical formula for that compound. All right, so the first, this, you know, this problem took up two pages, basically. The first page is kind of the new stuff. It's, it's being able to take amounts of carbon dioxide, amounts of water, and extracting out how much carbon and hydrogen those have in them. As I said, a couple ways to do it, but I, I, I use the approach of using mole conversions. And then once we have masses of each element, we then go and follow the same series of steps to get empirical formula. So this will probably be one of the most time-consuming types of problems we have. So as I said, make sure you practice it on the homework. Make sure you get good at all these steps and can do them effectively and efficiently because you know, our tests are time, so you need to be able to do that in the allotted period of time. All right, any questions on that? Yes? Uh, so why do I write it as CHBR3 and not in a diff different order? So in reality, the convention for formulas, but we're not going to really have you be responsible for this. The convention for formulas is that the least electronegative atom goes first, or what, we, what would be the central atom if it's a formula like this. The reality is it doesn't really matter, and, and we're, not going to, you know, we're not going to trip you up in the answer choices. So if you have to type the formula, we'll either tell you what order to type them in, or it won't matter. Um, if you have to do you know, multiple choice, obviously it'll be given in the answer choice what order it is. And it doesn't particularly matter that much for this type of problem. All right, anything else? All right, what we're going to move on to now is talking about chemical equations. So we've been dealing with amounts of substances and the relationship between mass and moles, moles and number of atoms and number of molecules. And now we're going to talk about chemical equations, chemical reactions where substances are converting between each other. So we're converting a set of substances into new substances. And what we're going to be able to do then is once we have a chemical equation, we can relate the amounts of substances that are involved, either that are as reactants or products. We've seen chemical equations a couple times already, so we've been introduced to them a little bit when we started talking about using bond energies to calculate delta E. We've seen them already in that context at the very least. So we're going to uh, you know, introduce them a little bit more formally today and then see how we use them to, to calculate amounts of substances. So there are two parts to a chemical equation. You have reactants and products. We've already sort of discussed this before. So reactants can be elements or compounds or both. Some combination of elements and compounds. So when you do a chemical reaction, these are essentially the ingredients you're mixing together are the reactants. And then they convert, you know, they, they rearrange their bonds, they form new substances, and those are what are called the products. So these are, again, some combination of elements and compounds can be formed as products. And that's what comes out of the reaction. 
All right. When we write a chemical equation, which is an equation that shows the reactants and products that are involved, we also include numerical coefficients in front of each reactant and product. So these are numbers that go in front. Typically, we will balance chemical equations with whole numbers, but they don't necessarily have to be. It's okay to have fractional coefficients if you need to or, or if it's not specified that you need to. All right, so numbers in front of each, sim of each symbol. So all of the elements and compounds in the chemical equation are going to be represented by their atomic symbol or chemical formula. And you're going to put numbers in front of each that tell you the number of, if it's an element, the number of atoms that are involved in the reaction. If it's a compound, the number of molecules that are involved in the reaction. Or alternatively, the way that we're going to usually interpret this is in terms of number of moles. Okay? So remember that the number of atoms and the number of moles are related by Avogadro's number. So the coefficients can be interpreted either as the number of individual atoms and molecules that are reacting with each other, or on a larger scale, the number of moles of each substance that are reacting with each other. So it's, it's really the mole interpretation that's more useful for us. But it's, it tells you the number of each of those species, the species being the elements or compounds that are reactants or products, that are involved. And then a key component of a chemical equation is what well, we have to do what's called balancing the equation. We're going to learn how to do that here in a second, where the number of atoms and the type of atoms on one side of the equation, the reactant side, has to be the same as the number of atoms and the types of atoms on the product side. So we don't create or destroy atoms in a chemical reaction. All right, so we have to remember the law of conservation of matter, which is one of the first mass laws, or maybe the first mass law we learned, which is that atoms are neither created or destroyed. So whatever atoms, whatever types of elements appear on the reactant side, those same atoms, those same elements, and the same number of them will have to appear on the product side. All right, so a correct chemical equation will have this criterion fulfilled where you're, ne you're neither creating or destroying atoms as part of, of the chemical equation. Uh, reaction that's, that you're depicting. Okay, so that's kind of in, in general form what we have in a chemical equation. Now let's learn how to set them up. Um, because one thing we're going to have to start doing in a lot of the, the problems we're working towards in this section is we will describe a chemical reaction to you or we will give you an unbalanced chemical equation and you'll have to provide the correct balanced chemical equation. Because for all the types of conversions and calculations we're going to be doing, if you don't have a ba balanced chemical equation, um, you're basically DOA. You can't even start the problem. All right, so let's start and seeing how we do that. So if we have a chemical equation, we're going to first arrange reactants and products. And we've kind of already seen this a little bit, so this shouldn't be a terrible surprise. So we have reactants on the left, products on the right, separated by an arrow. All right. And then we have to add coefficients to make sure that the number of each type of atom that's on the reactant side is the same as the number of each type of atom that's on the product side. Usually it's not that difficult to do this by, by inspection, um, but in some cases if it is a little bit difficult, my suggestion is always we're going to take the most complex of the reactants or products, which, which I would say is the one that has the most different elements in it, And we're going to set that to a coefficient of 1, and we're going to balance everything else rel relative to that. So that's a good way to start in some of the more complex uh, situations. In other cases, you can pretty much just look at both sides and tell what, you, what coefficients you need. And the more you do this, the faster that will become. There is one type of chemical equation we'll cover in Chapter 6 where balancing is a lot more complicated. We're going to learn a separate method for doing that. But for now, we're just going to balance chemical equations where you can basically look at the reactants and product side with a little bit of you know, trial and error, basically figure out what coefficients you need to balance them. Um, so once we, once we decide which of our coefficients we're going to set to 1, we adjust the coefficients. So we want to make sure that the atoms balance out. And then when possible, use whole numbers. Um, we will specify on homework and test questions whether it's necessary to use whole numbers if we're asking you some question about balancing the equation. 
in reality, if you're just using the chemical equation to do something more complex, like a stoichiometry problem that we're going to get to later today or, or next time, um, if, you use, if you're just using the chemical equation, it doesn't really matter if the coefficients are all whole numbers, but it's still usually convenient to have that be the case. Um, and then we, once we have coefficients, we check. We can make sure that the number of atoms on the left and the type of atoms, and we're not changing the identity of them either, is the same as the number of atoms on the right. And we also need to sometimes indicate states of matter. So you'll see these in a lot. It's not going to be something that is terribly important at this stage, but if you see little letters and parentheses next to the reactants and products, that just tells you whether they're solid, liquid, or gas. Um, that's not terribly important right now for what we're doing. So sometimes we'll leave these out. Sometimes they'll be there, but don't let it throw you off if they are there. Um, okay. This will be a little bit more important in the next chapter, but not so much right now. But you will see those in some chemical equations, so just be aware of what they mean. All right, let's, let's balance them and see how this works. So the first one we'll do is it's a combustion reaction. So we talked about combustion analysis. So what happens in a combustion reaction is you take an organic compound. This time it's just a hydrocarbon, C2H6. You add oxygen, you burn it, and you form carbon dioxide and water, as we said. Let's figure out how to write a properly balanced equation that depicts this process. So again, two reactants, carbon C2H6, which is called ethane, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide is a product, water is a product. Um, states of matter not indicated here, but they would likely all be gases. Actually, I put the state of matter on C2H6 and nothing else, so that was pretty stupid of me. But anyway, we don't need to worry about that for this. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to set the most complex reactant or product, the one that has the most atoms in it. We're going to set that to a coefficient of 1 to start. Any opinions on which one that should be? Let's do C2H6. That's a good choice. We'll set that to a coefficient of 1. And then we'll make sure that on the right side of the equation, we have the same number of atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if you look at uh, what you want, also want to look for are elements that only appear once, in other words, in, in only one reaction or one product on each side. So carbon, for example, carbon appears just in C2H6 on the reactant side. It only appears in CO2 on the product side. So we can balance that one very easily. Um, okay, so if we have... C2H6 on the reactant side, that means we have one of those and there's a total of two carbons. That means we have to have two carbons on the product side, so that'll give us a coefficient of two. Remember, we don't want to change the chemical formulas. We don't want to start changing these subscripts here because that changes the identity of the compound altogether. We just want to add numbers in front to make sure that the atoms are balanced. So we put a two in front of there. Hydrogen also appears only once on each side. So we have six hydrogens here on the reactant side. So we're going to put what in front of water to make sure there's six hydrogens there. A three. Three times two is six. Oxygen will save to the end, the reason being that oxygen appears once on the reactant side, but it appears twice on the product side. So there's a lot of different combinations of coefficients that could work to balance oxygen. So we save that for the end. What we see now is that for oxygen on the product side, we have two times two from CO2. We have three from water, so we have a total of seven on the product side. So how do we make sure that we have seven oxygens on the reactant side? So we have O2. What do we have to multiply O2 by to get a total of seven oxygen atoms? 3.5 or 7 over 2. Okay. So in this case, we have to at least start with fractional coefficients. That's sometimes necessary to do, and it is here. So we start with that. If the problem specifies that we should only have whole number coefficients, which, again, we will specify that if it's important. Then what we do is we need to get rid of that. So if we have a 7 over a 2 or a 3.5, how do we make that a whole number? We multiply it by 2. But remember, once we've balanced the equation, as we did in the first step, we have to multiply every coefficient by the same number. We can't just change the oxygen coefficient or it won't be balanced anymore. So we take every single coefficient and multiply it by 2. So this 1 becomes a 2. 7 halves becomes a 7. 2 becomes a 4. 3 becomes a 6. So whatever you do to one coefficient in a balanced chemical equation, you have to apply the same operation to every single one. All right, And that gives us then the final balanced equation, 2C2H6, 7O2s, 4O2, 6 waters. We can check. So if we have 
carbon. On the left side, we have 2 times 2, which is 4. On the right side of the chemical equation, we have 4 CO2s, so we have 4 times 1, which is also 4. So carbon is balanced. Again, if you have time, especially, it's good to check yourself. If we do oxygen next, well, let's do hydrogen next. And that's carbon again. Let's do hydrogen. All right, hydrogen on the left side, we have 2 times 6, which is 12. Two molecules of C2H6, so a total of 12 hydrogens. On the right side, we have 6 water, so now it's going to be 6 with 2 each, which is also 12. So hydrogen balances out. And then for oxygen, what we have on the left side is going to be just 7 O2s, so that's going to be 7 times 2, or a total of 14 oxygens. In the final balance equation, on the right side, we have 4 times 2 from CO2, 4 CO2s. We have 6 waters that each have 1, so 4 times 2 is 8, plus 6 is also 14, and those balance out as well. So you can always check yourself at the end and make sure that the number of each type of atom on the left side, the number of each type of atom on the right side end up being the same. All right, let's do a couple of other examples. Um, so another variation which will sometimes come up is that we don't actually give you all the reactants and products. We just give you some information. So we say FeO2, Fe2O3, which is rust, is formed by the reaction of iron and oxygen and gas. <coughs> Write a balanced equation for the formation of rust. So this one, again, is a little bit more involved because we have to arrange the reactants and products first. They weren't given to us directly in this case. So we're saying that FeO2,3 is formed. Remember, whatever is formed is on the product side. And then the reaction is between iron and O2. So those are our reactants. Okay? So iron is just Fe by itself. We have to know those atomic symbols, the first 36, as, as we've been emphasizing. So we have Fe by itself as one reactant. Oxygen gas, as we'll learn a little bit more detail on later on, is actually O2. Dioxygen, as it's sometimes called. So those are our two reactants. And then the product that's formed is rust, which is Fe2O3. Um, we don't have huge problems with rust in Houston, but where I grew up in Ohio, cars rusted all the time, and this is the reaction that was happening to make that rust, iron and oxygen. Now, as written, this is not balanced, uh, as you can clearly see, so we just have to set some things. And again, the more complex species, the one that has the most atoms in it, the most different elements especially, would be this one here. We set that to one. And so if we now have two irons on the product side. If we set this to one, we're not going to change this coefficient unless we need to at the very end. So we have two irons on the product side, so that means we get a coefficient of two there. We have three oxygens on the product side, Fe2O3. So again, if we have O2, well, we have to multiply that by to get three total oxygen atoms. Three over two. So 1.5 times two is three, so that's also three oxygens. Um, and if we specify that you should balance with lowest whole number coefficients, we would take all of this and again double it to get rid of this 3 over 2 fraction. So what we end up with is 4Fe plus 3O2 going to 2Fe2O3. So every single coefficient has to get doubled to convert to the form that only has whole numbers. Yep. Well, you always want to make sure that the reactants and products so match each other. So that's where you have to decide at the beginning which of the species you're going to set to a coefficient of 1. So we decided at the beginning to make this a coefficient of 1 because it's our most complex reactant or product. So then we're going to balance everything else relative to that. If we wanted to make this a 2, we'd have to multiply it by 2 over 3. But if we change that, we change the number of irons, which we already balanced earlier. So you have to s pick one, set it to a coefficient ideally of one usually to start with, balance everything else relative to that, and then adjust at the end. If you try to go back and forth in both ways, you're going to end up unbalancing and undoing what you've already done. So you want to make sure you're careful about that. Anything else? All right, last one, which is um, kind of a fun one. It looks complex, but it actually ends up not being that bad. So this compound here, which has a formula of cesium-4, rhenium-6, lenium-8, I-6. Now, you're wondering why did I pick this goofy example. Um, this is the 
first compound I made as an undergraduate researcher um, a number of years ago that I don't care to admit. So this will always hold a special place in my heart. It's, it's one of my, you know, it has, I have fond memories of this one. And so when I went into the lab the first time as, as a student not too different age than you guys are now, um, you know, the, the first thing I had to do was figure out, well, if I'm going to take these reactants, rhenium, selenium, cesium iodide, and I2, and mix them together in the correct ratio to eventually form this complicated product here, what are the coefficients that I need to be able to do that? So again, these things we learn about balancing chemical equations, and later on when we start talking about stoichiometry, this is all stuff that happens in research labs every day when you're trying to prepare new, new chemical compounds. So if we want to do this, we have to write out the reactants and products. So it's going to be rhenium RE, and then we have selenium SE, Cesium iodides, so sorry, I'm carving that up, it's right there, cesium iodide, and then I2, those are our four reactants. And the way that you actually make this is kind of cool. You just take these four reactants, they're all solids, you mix them together, kind of, you know, blend them together, and then you just put it into a furnace and heat it up to 800 degrees Celsius for four days. Uh, it's pretty hot if you're not familiar with the, how, how, how 800 Celsius feels. It doesn't feel good if you were in that oven yourself. And that ends up forming this complicated structure, CS4, cesium-4, rhenium-6, selenium-8, and I6. So this was, again, one of the very first, or maybe the first chemical reaction I did as an undergraduate researcher, very special to me. Okay, so we have to figure out coefficients that we do. Um, I think it's pretty clear what the most complex species is in this reaction. It's the product, right? We'll set that to 1, and we're going to balance everything else relative to that. So again, the trick is to find the elements that only appear once on each side. We don't want to start with iodine, because iodine is in our product, but if we look at the reactant side, we have iodine here and here. So if we try to balance iodine, we'd be going all over the place and, and mess messing ourselves up. So we start with other elements that appear once. So we can start with cesium, CS, that only appears in one of the reactants and products. There's four of them in the product, so we get a coefficient of four there. And then finally we have rhenium, which is six. So we're going to put a six in front of the reactant to make sure there's six rhenium's on both sides. Selenium only appears once. There's eight in the products. So we need an eight here. And then finally, we can figure out how much I2 we have. We don't want to change this coefficient anymore because we already set this coefficient as four to balance out cesium. But we see that our product has six iodines. We've only put four onto our reactant side. So how many more do we need? We need one of these molecules for a total of two more, okay? Because this has four iodines, this has two, that's a total of six. That is six, so we don't even need a coefficient in front of I2. It's still going to be one, okay? So this would say is one. Um, so again, sometimes the elements that appear twice on one side, you have to sort of balance them in pieces like we did and save them for the very end. So for iodine, we have four from this reactant. We need two more to make six, so that's why we need one I2 to balance that out correctly. Now keep in mind when you write chemical equations, the standard way to write them is to not include coefficients of 1. So normally if we saw this chemical uh, equation written, it wouldn't have those coefficients that are 1. It would just have it lit written like this. Um, and what, but with what we leave them in uh, to help us sometimes. Now what this question asks also is determine the sum of the coefficient on the reactant side. So very often in Blackboard, you know, it's hard for you to type out entire chemical equations and there would be a lot of rooms in Blackboard for that to get messed up. So we will often ask you, what is just the sum of the coefficients on one side or the sum of all the coefficients? And that's the typical way that we would address these types of questions in Blackboard. So the sum would just be taking all of those numbers on the reactant side. So 6 for rhenium. The sum of the coefficients is not a very useful quantity. It's just the way that we ask these questions to make sure you did them correctly. Um, so we have 8 for selenium. We have 4 for cesium iodide. Now remember, if you don't have a coefficient written, it is implied to be 1, so it might not be written explicitly as 1, but it's still there as 1. So 1 from I2, that's one that people would often forget, so don't forget that one. And we end up with 19 as our final sum of coefficients on the reactant side. Okay? All right, any questions on balancing chemical equations? All right, we're probably not going to get quite as far as I intended, but let's just move on to some of the basics of stoichiometry, and then we'll start doing example problems on it next time. Um, so we're going to give the process here for stoichiometry. All right, now the typical type of conversion we're going to do at the beginning is mass to mass, but let's, let's see first a more general definition of stoichiometry. 
So what stoichiometry refers to is the process of calculating the amounts of reactants and or products involved in a chemical reaction. All right, and the way that you typically do this is, you know, you'll, 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 you'll have the problem set up for you, and you will say, basically, I want to make this much product, how much of this reactant do I need? Or, I want to use this much reactant, how much of the other reactant do I need? Something like that. You'll have amount of one of the substances, and you will calculate the amount of another reactant or one of the products or, or some combination of those that's also involved in that same chemical reaction, okay? So that's what we're doing in stoichiometry, and the key concept here is mole ratios. So most of the steps that we do in stoichiometry problems are exactly the things we've already seen. Mass to moles, moles to mass, moles to number of atoms, number of atoms to moles. All those calculations we've been doing with moles are going to show up, but then there's one additional layer to the onion that we need to unveil now, which is mole ratios. So as you recall, when I introduced chemical equations, remember that the coefficients those numbers that show up in front of the reactants and products in a balanced chemical equation, so keyword being balanced. So every stoichiometry problem starts with a balanced chemical equation without it, your toast. And with those numbers, those coefficients, those tell us the relative numbers of moles of each substance that are involved. So if you have a generic chemical equation, 3A plus 2B going to 4D, not real substances obviously, but let's say that's what it looks like, we then use these coefficients as conversion factors. So we can say that for every three moles of A that we have in the chemical reaction, there's going to be two moles of B that react with it. And we can write this ratio in either direction, either three moles of A on top or three moles of A in the bottom. And we use that as a conversion factor to convert between amounts of A and amount of B in, in a molar sense. Or we can say that for every three moles of A that reacts, we form four moles of D. So we can relate reactants to products to, with each other using their mole ratios, just the coefficients from the chemical equation. Or we can say if we have two moles of B that are reacting, that requires two moles of B to form two, four moles of D and so on. So all these different combinations of coefficients can be written as ratios that relate the amounts of substances that are involved in a molar sense. Not in terms of mass, but in terms of moles, because the coefficients refer to moles. So let's just close then with a generic description of how this works before we start putting it into practice next time. So here's the process that we're going to follow in sort of a diagrammatic sense. We're going to make this diagram com increasingly more complex as we go through chapter 6 and learn some new relationships. But for now, all we have to worry about are the relationships that involve mass and moles and Avogadro's number that we've already learned. So typically what we do, the most common one is to take mass of one substance and figure out how much mass of a different substance is involved in that same chemical equation, where A is a reactant or a product, B is a different reactant or different product. Okay, So it's two different substances, and we want to figure out if we have some amount of A that's involved, how much mass of B is involved. And so we're trying to figure out this relationship. However, there's no direct way to do that because the coefficients in the chemical equation don't give us the masses, they give us the moles. So the process we're going to typically follow is we're going to use the molar mass of A, whatever A is, to convert A into moles. And then once we know the moles of one substance, we can find the moles of the other substance by using the stoichiometric coefficients. Those are those coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. So we can convert in between those using stoichiometry, which is what, that's what this is referring to. So stoichiometric coefficients, coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, allow us to determine how many, if we, have no, if we know how many moles of one substance we have, 
how many moles of the second substance would be involved. And then once we have moles of, of the second substance, if we so desire, we can convert that back into a mass using its molar, molar mass. And this is the process we would follow for a typical mass-to-mass -mass problem, which is probably the most common. You have mass of one substance, you want to find mass of the other, so you go through moles and mole ratios to get there. Now, there are some other ways we can, things we can throw in as well. If we want to know how many atoms or molecules of substance A, we use Avogadro's number, so we can throw that in as well. It's not as common or not as useful in most cases. But if we find the number of atoms or molecules of A, we use Avogadro's number. And if we want to find atoms or molecules of substance B, we also can use Avogadro's number to do that. And in reality, in a stoichiometry problem, we can start and end on any point of this sort of flow chart. As I said, the most common one is to start with a mass of one substance and to calculate a mass of another substance. But we could start with moles, we could finish with moles of substance as our final, we could just relate moles to each other. There's a lot of variations, and we're going to see a lot of those next time as we go through examples of stoichiometry. All right, so I will see you guys next week, last week before spring break.